three must know economic principles. Yes, freeze! Number one, subjective value. Subjective value is the concept that each individual values goods and services differently depending on their own wants and needs. As each person is unique, the desire for a particular good or service varies from person to person and even from moment to moment. For example, someone who prefers chocolate over vanilla ice cream might only ever purchase chocolate ice cream. However, their preference for vanilla ice cream might shift temporarily if they were hosting a party and wanted vanilla ice cream for their guests. No one would know that individual's preference at any given time without having the ability to read that individual's mind. Why this concept is critical to understanding economics is because it helps people recognize that subjective value can only be met if people are free to trade and choose what they value most. If people can determine what they want and what they're willing to give in exchange, then transactions will only take place where each party has determined that they're bettered by making the trade. Voluntary exchange is symbolic of the fact that each party feels that they are better off because the exchange was made, even if the exchange is being made due to a prior unfavorable condition, such as getting a flat tire needing repair. This method of voluntary trade permits the constant flux of nuance in individual consumer choices so that individual needs and wants are met effectively without violence. One-size-fits-all policies, that is, central planning, cannot account for the nuances in relative individual valuations and thus will always lead to dangerous outcomes as shortages and oversupply become rampant due to insufficient adjustment to the constantly changing market demands. Number two, the economic calculation problem. The economic calculation problem is the concept that central planning of the economy cannot effectively take place because the wants and needs of a population are too diverse. As individual desires are constantly in flux, central planners lack the knowledge required to meet all possible needs and demands of a population at large. When central planning takes place, much of the understanding about what is market valued is lost due to lack of prices. That is, a communication using money to see the aggregate of who is demanding what kinds of goods and services. When this lack of price signal is coupled with a lack of competition to produce new and more efficient kinds of goods and services, the centrally planned economy eventually comes to ruin, as has been seen in China under Mao, Russia under Stalin, and as we're seeing now in Venezuela under Maduro. To have an ethical and effective economy, the diversity of human actors must be allowed to observe adapt and innovate in competition for efficiencies to arise. Without an open talent pool, the ability to accommodate and innovate is limited to what those in control believe is best. As history has shown, that limitation has dire consequences as the economy regresses under a lack of insight beyond the small minds of petty tyrants. Number three, Economics of the Unseen In observing the nature of market intervention by governments through central planning, one critical aspect often missed is the economics of the unseen. That is, the study of what is not gained because of one-size-fits-all policies. The economics of the unseen have been expounded upon by Frederick Bastiat in the Broken Window Fallacy Discourse. Bastiat notes that some erroneously believe the destruction of a window is an economic benefit because it gives the window maker work. What is missed is that the money that was spent to fix a window could have been used to hire someone else for new economic development if the window was not broken. What the money would have been used for otherwise is the unseen, because what the money could have gone to instead of window repair never comes to fruition. Likewise, in many aspects of government intervention, the unseen is what could have been created and brought to fruition if resources had not been taken by the state. Worse, many life-saving innovations are missed because of government regulation in the market, where the government prevents alternatives from arising. Whenever the government takes money or acts to prevent innovation, one should always ask themselves what the unseen consequences are by comparing the outcome to other places where such intervention does not take place. You'll discover that much of the abundance we have today only arose because property rights were respected 
and the government did not interfere with market innovation. If you want to see economic prosperity open for all, you must end taxation and free the market. Thank you for watching and for supporting my work, and a special thank you to my fiducers, the Asian capitalists Zach Glukowski and Crawford K. McDonald of ECM Real Estate Group. To join my monthly live hangouts and to help choose the next video I produce, join my Patreon page at the Philosopher's Pho or Boba Tea level. See you soon! Yes, please! Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on, on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. So today, oh, so before I get into that, um, Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I am delighted to have a returning guest, the philosopher coming in from the East Coast of America. Uh, her website is thephilosopher.com. That's philosopher, but just P-H-O-L-O-S-O-P-H-E-R.com. And, uh, and from there you can find links uh, to her on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And uh, we're going to discuss um, a little bit of peaceful parenting, uh, talk about spanking, corporal punishment. Um, is it a good idea? No. no. Spoiler, it's not. Um, <laughs> and uh, three, and her latest video, Three Economic Principles That You Must Know or That You Need to Know. And then another video she made about sacred cows of government and um, <clears throat> talking about Memorial Day and what she thinks about that. So um, the philosopher, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. Hey, Danilo. Happy to be on again. Yes, we had a wonderful conversation last time. So, of course, have to have another one. We can't have enough conversations with <laughs> volunteers. You know, we don't, unfortunately, we don't live so true. Ne next door to each other in our, uh, you know, in our uh, Ancapistan, um, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, <land>. unfortunately. <laughs> so we got to do this. So. <laughs> yeah, I definitely wish uh, more Ancaps were, were together and local, but... I guess that's why we go to Libertarian Party meetups and try to convert them to be more ANCAPs and volunteerists. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, our uh, our big um, annoyance is that we try to take over the world to leave everybody alone, right? And I, I'm sure people are very, <laughs> yeah. very annoyed by that. <laughs> yes. Stop trying to convert me. Stop trying to brainwash me into being free. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird? definitely one way. <laughs> Isn't it yeah, weird? Yeah. It's, just, it's just strange how people people constantly advocate for their own uh, enslavement and their own, you know, fetters and encumbers. But uh, that's the way. That's the way. That's the nature. The contradictory nature of statism. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So that, that's a good topic to talk about in itself. Of course. So uh, so yeah, <laughs> please get into um, what you what you think of as peaceful parenting, and uh, and and your view on spanking and corporal punishment. Okay, so my thoughts on peaceful parenting is I think that that is the best way to raise uh, people to be voluntarists, which means just people who respect the individual bodies and properties of other and seeks to maximize consent with other individuals. Um, and I think that the way we create people who have that ethic ethical system is to treat our children um, with those same principles and ethics. 
So just like with the philosophy of volunteerism, where you want to maximize consent and minimize the initiation of violence, you would do that with your children if you have them. So spanking is initiating violence. And as much as some people who advocate for spanking and say that it's necessary want to try to say spanking is initiating aggression. And it's carried out usually by people who are four, five times, six times the size of a child. And um, so I'm definitely against that. And because I value and hold the voluntarist principles um, as part of my core ethics, I, have, I advocate that it should be applied to all human beings and all human interactions, especially children, since they didn't choose to, you know, be born. <laughs> so um, overall, I think peaceful parenting ties in nicely with voluntarist philosophy because it is just an application of voluntarist principles. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and all that makes you a a, a crazy uh, lunatic that should be locked up because you're just a danger to society. No, <laughs> right, <laughs> <Somehow>. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's exactly how they see. Uh, you know, when we the things that we talk about, like you know, what do we what are we really advocating when it comes to child raising and peaceful parenting? Is basically encouraging children to reason things out for themselves and by and in order to do that we have to demonstrate how to reason things out and if we if our message to them is don't hit and don't take other people's things or, and don't you know don't use violence to solve your problems then maybe we should model that <laughs> in our own right, behavior exactly you know basically you're saying don't do the whole do as i say but not as i do kind of uh, teaching that I see with a lot of parents, you know, don't hit your brother, but I'm going to hit you for hitting your brother or, you know, don't steal, but I'll take away your, your toys or the things that I bought you and gifted to you, which is your property. Now take it away whenever I want to punish you. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, definitely just more about just being ethically consistent and being a role model, as you're saying. Yeah, your being kids. a role model, and I mean, I, I consider myself as a as a friend and advisor, you know, and, yeah. and hopefully someone that they would want to come to for advice because I'm I just have more experience, right? Not not um not an authority figure that I can uh, you know hand hand down dictates and mandates and tell them what to do because I'm bigger and stronger. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's not <laughs> that's the might makes right you know um concept and uh and you know that's not really you know it's just a, just because you can beat someone up that doesn't mean that you're correct <laughs> you're yeah. that you're making a, a you know a logical argument <laughs> definitely and i think you know i want to clarify too that it's possible to have someone look up to you and respect you but based on their own consent or individual determination of you that's completely consensual or as consensual as possible. You can still have um, an authority in some respects in terms of, you know, when someone turns to you for advice, they're seeing you as an authority. Or if they know that you're very knowledgeable a topic about a topic, they'll turn to you, um, you know, as an authority on that topic. You know, no different than at work, you go to certain people on your team who are specialists for advice on different things. Or, you know, if I wanted to understand a lot more about American history and the founding of America, I'd probably turn to Tom Woods or something because he studied the topic extensively. So it's possible to have authorities, but what we are against is voluntarists. I switch between voluntarists, voluntarists. I don't know. I'm still, I like voluntarists, but I go back. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what we as a uh, uh, voluntary, <laughs> I lost my thought. <laughs> yeah, you, you're talking about the about. difference between vo voluntary hierarchy as opposed to coercive hierarchy. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I sometimes get off a tangent. No problem. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we as voluntarists are against mandatory authorities. Right. So that's the whole thing with our children is we want to teach them that 
it is wrong for us to impose our authority and force them to follow our orders and respect us. We, as much as possible, want to show them that their individual thoughts and viewpoint and consent matters. That's why we try to reason with them. No different than how we would handle any other interaction with a fellow adult. Um, There really should be no false dichotomy when it comes to ethics for children and adults, which a lot of people have. They want to say, well, you know, I would never beat my wife, for example, or I'd never beat up my friend if we had an issue or a problem or they were doing something that was alienating me. I would go to my friend or my wife and talk to them and have a discussion. Um, But some people with children, they make an exception and they say with children, for some reason, the only way to have a child change their behavior is through violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pain, specifically. Um, What was the last thing you said? Oh, and I said uh, causing them physical pain, specifically. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so yeah, you brought a, a couple of topics. Uh, one is, um, yeah, the idea of voluntary um, hierarchy versus coercive hierarchy, and yes, that's definitely that's definitely something that a lot of people confuse when when we describe ourselves as an anarchist. You know, like I, I hear that all the time. They're like, you know, I go into a I don't know a business, and and, and you know, some, somebody tells me tells I'm in, I'm with the group, right? And somebody lays down the rules, and they're like, Danilo, but Danilo doesn't like that. <laughs> I'm like, right, like I'm you're like, against rules. Right, they right. Confuse it as you being against all rules. There yeah. should be no rules or structure. Yeah. Right, but that's not the case. <laughs> I, I know, I know, and uh, and it's re- really ridiculous. I mean, people have to see the difference between that. Like, um, and 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 the other thing is respect. You said, um, yeah, I, I've I've always felt that that people do not automatically get respect just because of how many years they've been on this earth. You know, that doesn't that doesn't necessitate respect, right? Respect is something totally that agree. is earned over time by your actions, by your words, you know, and you can't force that at all. You can't force someone to respect you just like you can't force someone to love you, right? <laughs> These are things yeah, exactly. that happen voluntarily. And so, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate when parents resort to, um, you know, uh, coercion when they when they want their kids to respect them. You know, that's unfortunate. That that to me signals a failure of being a parent. You know, you have failed yeah. at your job of of uh, raising your kids in such a way that they want to look up to you and they want to respect you. You know, that's to mm-hmm. me that's the goal, right? Um, and uh, you know, my kids. Uh, I have um, uh, my daughter's going to be six soon and my my son's gonna mm-hmm. be eight and uh but my daughter is fiercely <laughs> wow. fiercely independent and and she's like she's had like one sleepover already out of her friend's house she wants to have another one already she's only five i can't believe it and uh, and she's, really? like, she's cut her own hair she's cut her own hair two times two on two separate occasions <laughs> yeah and it's like and she and she like she has no fear about just walking away and just like like sometimes they, you know, we're we're in a crowded area. She just walks away. I'm like, wait, you can't go by yourself. You're only five, <laughs> so yeah, no fear of anybody. Wow. And and um and, and are I remember... they both homeschooled, by the way? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, homeschooled slash unschooled. Or self right, self directed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Very cool. And so, so wait, I want to pause. Go ahead, go ahead. So she sounds like she has no problem with socialization. <laughs> One of the objections yeah. to unschooling is, oh, they won't get socialized if they don't go to public school where they'll be shamed by other students and teachers. <laughs> I know, I know. And, they and, won't develop healthy socialization if, you know. It's, uh, yeah, you know, my, my kids you know love to go to um, new playgrounds and new parks and meet new people. Mm-hmm. And new kids because they automatically make friends. Like they make friends so quickly, so easily. It amazes me, <laughs> you know. And uh, you know, and I think that um, you know, like I have always been easy to talk to and easy to meet new people. And I, you know, try to crack jokes, make people laugh. And, you know, I think that that really helps people to to relax and you know bring their barriers down. You know, so um, I think my kids have also learned how to interact with people, right? Because they see me interacting with people. <laughs> and, and so, modeling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And Would so, you say they're very friendly? Like, oh yeah. do they tend to, 
you know, go up to other new kids, even strange strangers, and say, "Hey, like my name's blah blah blah. Want to play?" Yeah, they, they're so excited okay. to go up to new kids. They they say, "Hi, I'm Serena. <laughs> What's your name?" <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, that's cute. I can yeah. see how they'd make it automatically. <laughs> oh, it's great. And then and then the other parents, um, you know, they they frequently come up to me. And they're like, "Wow, my kid is playing so nicely with your kid." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i hear that a lot um so yeah so socialization that's just complete yeah <laughs> completely ridiculous. and they're five and eight you know that's yeah yeah you hear a lot um or at least i've heard a lot and i don't know if you have but just people saying oh those bratty kids or <laughs> they just see children as you know some people have the thought that children should be seen and not heard oh shit. and <laughs> just this very weird view of kids um yeah just like i was saying before just sort of this false dichotomy in terms of when it comes to human beings you know they have an idea of how they want to treat people and treat other humans but they make these exceptions for the most vulnerable and weakest humans Mm. little kids (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's a it's oh. a very large uh very large hypocrisy um and uh a giant exception just like the giant exception of uh morality where you know where you ask most mm-hmm. people and you say you say do you use violence to solve your problems in your daily life and they say no but everyone right. everyone thinks that the state is legitimate and that's one giant exception yeah. right so um so yeah if we, exactly if we want to teach people that there is no exception to morality right nobody has an exception no matter what uh, uniform you have on, what badge you have on, and uh, and I frequently talk to my kids in uh, as we're driving, and I talk to them about the police and the military, and uh, oh yeah, because Memorial Day was recently, and we saw we saw some uh, veterans on the road, and they were asking for money, right? And I said to them, "Do you know what a veteran is?" And they said, "No." And I said, "Well, that's uh, someone who went to war." And my, my my wife was in the car too. I said, you, "Someone who went to war," and uh, I think, and then uh, and then I said, "You know what war is." And they said, uh, they said, no, I don't really. And said, well, it's when <laughs> my, my wife put it nicer than I did. <laughs> I said, it's when it's when the soldiers go over to another place to hurt other people or kill them. Now, do you think that's a good thing? They said, no. And I said, now think about this. If I hurt someone intentionally or kill them here, I get prosecuted. I go to jail. But if someone joins the military and does the same thing overseas in another country they don't go to jail and in fact in fact they get a medal (laughs) sometimes they get rewarded and so and i said to my my kids does that make sense to you (laughs) and they said no it doesn't why that's Mm -hmm. strange (laughs) yeah i can i've debated a lot of people on this topic i can already hear some people who've either been in the military or have friends and family in the military who'd respond by saying, well, sure, it's killing people and initiating the killing, but in a way it's self-defense because we're killing people, you know, if they're talking about the Middle East, people who hate America. And of course they collectivize and say us. And they say, it's people who hate us. So if we don't kill them, they're going to just keep bombing you know, the U.S. and 9-11 is going to happen again and mm-hmm. we're going to get more terrorist attacks. So we got to snuff out the threat. And how, how would you respond to people who are claiming that it's self-defense? That's like that's like a, an argument from the movie Minority Report. Do you remember, um, have you seen that movie? Oh, that's an excellent I, movie. I use that movie so is, often in uh, in discussions on on this topic because oh, okay. because that's let free- me look it up. <laughs> yeah, or, well, look, I can summarize it for you. That it's a mm-hmm. it's a movie with Tom Cruise, and basically he he works in the police in the future, and they have a machine where they can tell who's going to commit a crime in the future. And so what they do is before the person commits the crime, they arrest the person. <laughs> oh, see, I haven't seen that. All right. Watch that because that is an excellent recommendation for all statists to watch because that ex- that is exactly the thought process of what you just said and also most laws. <laughs> it's like it's like right. you haven't done anything wrong like according to, you know, universal morality, but we're going to put you in jail because you violated one of our edicts, you know, or you know or or uh, or what you said is these people they haven't hurt us yet, but they just don't like us and so maybe we should hurt them first 
before they because hurt us. <laughs> we think right because we think there's a chance they might hurt yeah. me because they can and, hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> which is... I think you're right. That movie is um, a good example. I mean, I didn't watch it, but just based on what you said about the plot, mm -hmm. if what it is is the state going after people based on a technology they have that somehow lets them, you know, see mm. future actions, yeah. um, which that, you know, obviously doesn't make sense, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to my knowledge at this time, uh -huh. um, you know, what it's showing is when you do that, it probably shows how chaotic it can get when you're going after people violating their bodies mm. before even confirming and having evidence that they did anything wrong. So it really, you're exactly right. That is the sort of mindset that it's okay to go after people. If you think it's at all probable that they'll be violent in the future. Mm. Um, it's kind of the same you know, thinking that people have when it comes to restricting people's rights, uh, property rights, when it comes to guns, just because they didn't pass a certain, you know, mental health check. And of course, that mental health check doesn't, um, you know, it's not very clear about the behaviors that are going to happen, and it's not predictive. So, you know, the question comes up is, is it justified? Is it ethical to restrict someone's rights and to initiate violence against them when you think there's a chance that they could commit it in the future? And I would say that no, it's not ethical because the people who have that thinking, they would not be okay if somebody, you know, uh, let's just say met their mom or someone very close to them and assessed in their mind based on different, you know, criteria they had, like maybe they know that that person's mom uh, spanks her kids mm. or something, or, you know, um, lies to people. Mm -hmm. Like, may, you know, maybe she, they have this own criteria. And if they killed her, mm -hmm. I don't think that mm -hmm. person would be like, oh, Oh, did you think that she was going to commit violence in the future? Was that why? <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine then. I I understand. I mean, I know my mom right. more than you, so I don't think she would have. But <laughs> even if she was prone to violence, I think that you should, you know, talk to me. I don't, you know, they wouldn't just justify it. Like mm. they would be outraged and think, sure. why are you killing her yeah. when she didn't do anything wrong? Yeah. Um. So yeah. And I think when you said it goes against universal morality, I think to add some specifics there, it specifically goes against the principle of non-aggression, mm, one of the right. founding principles of voluntarism, mm -hmm. where because you own yourself and because you as an individual should have your body and your consent respected, that um, it is unethical to initiate violence against you. And because you're a human being, you would extend that same principle to every other human. And thus you, ha thus you have the non-aggression principle. And so to be more specific, it would violate that principle. It would violate the principle that initiating force is uh, unethical unless it's in self-defense. So because the there is no defense when a, you know, a soldier goes overseas and murders people, even if they say they outright hate the U.S. government mm. for, you know, um, having embargoes or dropping drone bombs, um, even if they have that, it is unethical to be initiating violence against them when that individual hasn't committed violence. It, it wouldn't be self-defense. Um, so, yeah. Just yeah, to and actually the, those people in the Middle East, uh, if they were to fight back, and uh, you know hurt or kill american soldiers that would be self defense because the soldiers are invading their land <laughs> you <Yes>, know yes exactly <laughs> so that is justified self defense and so when you look at it from that perspective who is a real terrorist in that situation in that case exactly <laughs> they're invading their property they're right. invading their homes right. and 
collectively punishing a group of people. Mm. They're not even, there's no trial. Mm. There's no, okay, before I bomb this house uh, full of people or this church full of people or hospital or wedding, uh, you know, the U.S. government doesn't and all the military, you know, um, people don't sit there and say, okay, let's just make sure this individual here, you know, whatever his name is, Bob, or I don't know, some Middle Eastern name, <laughs> um, <laughs> Bob, Bob, <laughs> Bob Pakistani, I don't know. Um, like, let's say, okay, he murdered, you know, this person and that person he murdered was an innocent child, oh. or they don't look at the individual, they mm. target areas. And they even admit the CIA and the military they in the U.S. government, they even admit that there's collateral, quote unquote, collateral damage, you know, mm -hmm. just a term to mm -hmm. right. obfuscate the reality and the of the horror of what's actually happening. But they don't look at individuals. Mm -hmm. They advocate for a war against a collective of people. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that because not every one of those individuals in that collective that you're abstracting to did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, recently was a Memorial day and, uh, and I posted a meme of, um, of a father and a son watching in this TV 60th anniversary of, of the bombing of Hiroshima. <laughs> and then the son asked the father, uh, which terrorist group did that? Right. And I, and I, and I got some, uh, some angry comments from some people defending that, you know, it's kind of saying like, uh, you know, those Japanese, they were going to come over here. They were going to, you know, they were going to hurt us all and kill us and all this stuff. And, uh, and, and even if you did think that, just like you said, collateral damage, a lot of innocent people killed those cities that the, that the bombs were dropped on were civilian cities. Those were non-military cities, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, completely innocent. Right. and, <laughs> and when is that ever just and so and so people people mistake uh the actions of the state for the people that live under in that region you know the civilians the private individuals that live in that region they they just associate those people with the actions of the military and the state and and that's very unfortunate you know like right. and, and same thing with you know um, you know, Hitler, right? You know, his actions and that of his, you know, underlings and military, much different <laughs> from the average German taxpayer at that time, didn't do anything wrong, you know, just working, you know, starting businesses, paying their taxes, you know, not really contributing to any of that. But um, unfortunately, you know, they got a lot of, uh, a lot of um, unfortunate collateral damage as well. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I then, think we've go, drawn go out Oh, sorry. Do you want to? No, no, you, you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think we've drawn out a couple of the, the fallacies that statism, status indoctrination imbues in people. Uh, the one that we talked about was advocating for ethical principles, mm. but allowing exceptions for them. So mm. either when it comes to the state, you know, mm. the military, police, mm. or even children. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing and that I didn't uh, say yet was um, collectivism. Yeah. That's the other, you know, fallacious type of thinking that statism imbues in people through indoctrination is thinking, looking at a group of people as one big collective when in reality, someone thinking, you know, China as a collective, mm. you know, doesn't, really exist it's it's the individual human conceptualizing reality and bucketing things mm -hmm. into abstract groups but in reality you couldn't say you know china hates us because you can't group all the people who live in china their thoughts and feelings into one behavior as if they're one giant hive mind or something yeah um and so that's the other type of fallacious thinking that I see a lot, you know, where people collectivize and, you know, say we or us or them versus us and this whole kind of herd mentality when actually the world is made up of individual human beings. And so that's one of the things that 
I've heard you do too, is try to help people be clear when they're talking about people mm. to focus on individuals and those specific individuals' actions. Mm -hmm. And because when you don't, you do things like, oh, we got to, it's okay if we bomb, um, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's okay because I see the people who were responsible as Pearl Harbor as being the same exact collective as the people we're going to bomb with our, our nuclear weapons. Um, and it's from that fallacious kind of thinking that you can justify such horror. They, you know, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was, and all the people who were killed and wounded, mostly a civilian city, um, that was murder. Mm. There's no other word for it, but mm. murder. Mm. And, you know, I'd be curious to see to look at who was responsible for Pearl Harbor, the, the specific individuals, and see if they were actually in that bombing um, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, I'd be, I'd be curious. And if they weren't, it would just go to show that, you know, even more to the point that it was murder. Mm. You know, it wasn't targeted at those individuals or anything like that. Mm. Um, and when instead that really should have been the focus uh, was a, you know, a thorough investigation of who did the actual harm, which individual were the ones who carried it out. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It would be as ridiculous as, you know, some guy from uh, some city murders like 20 people. Right. And then the U S government's like, okay, let's just drop a nuclear bomb on that entire city. It would be <laughs> just as preposterous. And the same people who justify the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be outraged if that happened. Mm, yeah. So, you know, um, which I guess now that I'm thinking about it would be a good example to bring up if the next time I, <laughs> I have a debate, which will probably happen, <laughs> bring up that example, like, well, would you, you know, find it justifiable if the U.S. government dropped a nuclear bomb in some city just because there was a serial killer who was born and raised and right. lived there and right. murdered people there? And, you know, right. it, it'll be fun. I like debating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, this is a good segue to your video, The Three Economic Principles uh, You Need to Know, because mm. one uh, one of the principles I think that you mentioned was um, how... Um, value is subjective right according to each individual and you know that's why collectivism fails <laughs> you cannot assume what a person is going to value on any particular time because even even to that particular individual value changes throughout the day <laughs> throughout the week throughout the yeah. month right all the time you can't you can't really predict these things um and so that's really why um a free market um is so much more prosperous and abundant and can um, serve so many more people, um, you know, so well, as opposed to, you know, command and controlled authoritarian, um, you know, socialistic economy, which does not allow, you know, the price mechanism to fluctuate, you know, according to supply and demand and competition. And, and so, you know, of course, as a result of that, you get shortages and, and surpluses and things go waste exactly. you know wasted and things like that so so you need to allow that freedom and and so yeah go into and what and go into the uh, the other uh, the other uh, economic principles that you mentioned there okay sure yeah so um those the video i did recently it was the most recent one i just released it was called three must know economic principles and they are uh, it starts with the subjective, or I'm sorry, value is subjective. So the idea that when people value goods and services and thus, you know, are willing to pay whatever amount for something, it's all based on their own individual subjective preference and desires. So that's the first one I cover. The second one is the knowledge problem, which it's, you know, following off, uh, continuing off of the first principle of value being subjective, it thus goes into saying that no individual can 
or even group of individuals can have the knowledge required to know what all other individuals in the world are needing and desiring at any given time. Mm -hmm. And that even if they were somehow able to survey everyone and, you know, understand their entire financial situation and goals and whatever at any point in time, as you said, it fluctuates. So they wouldn't be able to continue that anyhow. And what you need in a market where you're serving billions of people um, or even millions or even a small amount is you, you need the ability for people to set prices based on their own property rights and on a voluntary basis and to allow them, each individual, to decide what they want to purchase, how much, and how much they want to give for it. Mm -hmm. um, and without that, that leads to either oversupply or shortages uh, if you have a centrally planned economy because it's essential, a central planned economy is just a group of people or one guy um, saying that, okay, I claim to know that we need 10,000 t-shirts and I'm going to divvy up the resources and control it all mm. when um, it leads to oversupply is because uh, as I said, they just don't know what is needed at any given time. It, it is always fluctuating and you know um, the currently how it works in a, in a, well, relatively free market for looking at America um, is each individual supplier who owns the property, they, because it's their property and it's at stake, um, they are very careful about how much they produce and are always, you know, checking the pulse of who's demanding their products. And they're always uh, changing how much they produce things at any given time um, so that they don't create too much. Because if they create too much, then that's a bunch of products that may not be sold right away. And that's a bunch of wealth that you put into those products that are just sitting there that you could have used on other things like marketing or, you know, um, fixing up some, some issue or improving the technology of your operations, something like that. Um, which leads nicely what I just said into the third principle I cover is the economics of the unseen. Mm you know, where um, kind of like how someone sees a whole bunch of products made, that's what they see. But what is not obvious is what else could have been funded or produced had that money not been put into, you know, just way too much iPhones, for example, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, like Apple is very careful about, and one of the reasons they've stayed in business is they're very careful about how much they produce to keep up it with demand, but not produce too much so that they have uh, money left over or can af more efficiently allocate their resources to other things like customer service or dealing with returns um, or marketing, et cetera. So that's the third principle. And you actually, you did a video of this, which I saw this morning. Um, said, I think you said you recorded a few months ago. Yeah. Hey, hey, don't, 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 hey, hey, don't give my secrets out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> to be fair, I saw it this morning, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when you released it. I didn't, I didn't see that, so. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, you talked about it too, that... Um, one of the fallacies that people talk about when they're talking about the economics of the unseen is the broken window fallacy. The idea that if you, well, more to the fallacy, if you break a window because you're giving the window maker work, that you're somehow, quote unquote, stimulating the economy. Another example, and probably more prominent, is when you know, the state or people within the state and special interests, politicians, lobbyists um, say that, oh, we need to go to war to stimulate the economy. It's like this this uh, 
thinking that somehow, like you put it in your video, destroying wealth creates wealth. Mm, and what right. is unseen is where all of that wealth and resources could have gone to had it not been, uh, you know, having a window broken. Um, so that's why, you know, within a voluntary society, what's really important is the respect of not only individual bodies, but as an extension of that, those individuals' property. And to leave it up to the individual, how, um, what they decide to do with their property, if they want to maintain it, if, if that homeowner decides to get new fancier windows, it should be totally up to the individual property owner. Um, so yeah, and not to the hands of tyrants or petty thieves, you know, if it was like someone who just breaks a window. Um, tyrants or petty thieves. Um, but you're, <laughs> but you're repeating yourself though. <laughs> well, they're not, they're not. Pet Actually, that reminds me of a great quote by Aesop. Um, it's probably the same. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a great quote like by Aesop, same, yeah. which is, which is we, um, we imprison the petty thieves and appoint the great ones to, to positions of power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was, I agree with you. They're the same yeah. people in a way, but yeah, I was making that distinction. Right, I understand. Tyrants being the one who control the state and yeah. petty thieves being, yeah, the people who are locked up and get caught exactly. by the tyrants. Exactly. They're, they're the, uh, they're the yeah. amateurs, the amateur right. thieves, the they're, real, the, the true <laughs> the high class yeah, thieves going to a are public the office. Amateur. <laughs> exactly. The, the ones who are sophisticated to go into political office. The, if you want, you know, if you're someone who seeks power and wants to control other human beings, the best place to do that is not to acquire a bunch of money. It's to get into positions of power. <laughs> it's to be in control of the state. Um, because without the state, having money um, can be a way, can be a persuasive mechanism, but it's not a coercive mechanism. You can, you know, throw as much money as you want at someone, like right. a million dollars and, mm. you know, ask them to do something. But in the end, without force, without the ability to force them mm. to comply with you, they can just walk away. Mm -hmm. So that's why the most sophisticated people who are the most power hungry and want the most control and are also highly intelligent um, go into the highest levels of government. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned so many things there, and I would love to get into them. Uh, I mean, I just, I just mentioned real quick the, uh, yeah, the economic calculation problem. Excellent, excellent um, uh, rebuttal for anybody who advocates for socialism or communism. Um, there just is no way for a um, a group of people to predict what um, you know, thousands or millions of people will want or need in the future. Absolutely no way. You know, the, it's like it's like one business owner on a daily basis is constantly making decisions. Things are constantly changing. You know, you have to, uh, you know, f repair these things, hire new workers, fire workers, you know, change your product, improve your product. You know, so all these decisions constantly just for one business. <laughs> and how do they expect to pass laws that will benefit um, thousands or millions of businesses and they think, that they're doing a good thing <laughs> in what world do they think that it's amazing it's really truly amazing and exactly. uh, yeah and, and the other thing you mentioned the broken window fallacy which is a wonderful um little idea that i uh, frequently bring up to people because it, it because everybody understands it like they don't understand they don't really know that it's called a broken window fallacy but when you explain it to people then they begin to understand it. <clears throat> and yeah, like my friend got into this car accident. Like my mother, I remember one time she um, she dropped a jar. I was in the kitchen with her and she dropped a jar, a glass jar on the floor and it broke. And she said, um, she said, damn, now I got to spend 15 minutes clean this up. That's 15 minutes out of my day. I could have spent doing other things. And I said, do you, are you familiar with the broken window? <laughs> <laughs> <I started laughs> do you, you <laughs> I got to ask, and I already know the answer yeah. because I've seen it, but do you like to drop Liberty seeds? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, and the best, the best way let me, to do Let it... me give you a virtual high five because yeah. like, <laughs> I feel like it's like I, I meet a lot of fellow volunteers like Sterling Lujan or, awesome. you know, Jack V. Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they're always dropping little Liberty seeds when they talk to anyone. They're at the 
grocery store, you go to the bar, you meet people or, you know, existing friends and family. And um, I notice when I hang out with my fellow volunteers, friends, or, and I do this too, is like any opportunity we get, it's like, we're always monitoring the conversation and what's happening. And we're just seeing like, oh, is this a chance to like drop a Liberty <laughs> seed? So I knew your answer was yes. Cause I've, I've always, I've seen you, uh, I've seen examples of you doing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, and the best way to do it, the, the way I look at it is just to mention this principle, you know, you don't have to say I'm a volunteer. So you don't have to say I'm an anarchist or I'm a free marketeer or I'm an anarcho-capitalist. You know, forget about the labels. Just just talk about the principles, right? And if they understand that and then you explain another principle and they understand that and then you say, oh, by the way, I'm an anarchist. And like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense because of all <laughs> these things that you told me about. <laughs> you know? It's yeah, a- exactly. That's a, that's a good method to have it be more conversational and yeah. to bring it up when – uh, during a situation that's you know specifically impacts them or they they experience um, like I've done this a lot with my mom <laughs> and my dad mm. is if I see you know uh, my mom she was complaining about how she always has to pay property tax mm. and that spun up a conversation I was like oh a chance and <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to her and um, I was saying so I was like, do you think that it's right for you to be taxed? Uh, mm-hmm. Like, do you think it's justified or do you wish that you could stop paying property tax? Mm-hmm. And she's like, at first she goes, well, I mean, I think it's OK because it's paying for electricity and paying for the garbage. I'm like, no, wait, mom, you actually don't you get uh, don't you pay for those separately? She's like, oh, wait, you're right. That's a different company. There's a company for waste services. There's a company for electricity. Mm. And then I was like, so, yeah, exactly. So what is property tax going for? And she's like, there's no service that I'm paying for directly. And then I said, or I asked her, like, and when do you get to stop paying property taxes? (laughs) And she goes, oh, my God. And I kind of freaked out. (laughs) And she's like, never. And I was like, even if you pay off your house, right? And she's like, yeah, you're right. Even if, and she's like, that's, that's crazy. And she started like feeling really angry and, <laughs> you know, thinking that was so unjustified. It's like she, it dawned on her and she realized that, wow, even if I pay off my house, it's not my house. And then I, you know, asked her and I said, and what, what happens if you don't pay your property taxes? Like, let's say you lost your job and even if you paid off your home, um, you just couldn't afford the property tax. What would happen? She said, well, the state would come and they would take my home. They'd take it back. And it was like this, it turned into this real conversation about, <laughs> isn't it crazy that you can't actually own your own property? Mm. Even if you pay it off, even if you spent your money that you worked and spent your precious time and energy on to earn that you don't actually own your home because the state declares that they own all the land within this arbitrary geographical area called the United States of America. And yeah, so it, you know, that was one example of a liberty seed I dropped to my mom. And uh, since then it like, she started to really understand that taxation is theft and that it really is done via coercion and she brought she gave me other examples like how um when she used to work in Chinatown <laughs> uh when she first came over to America escaping the Vietnam War uh she worked as a waitress at a what do you know it a pho restaurant I love pho <laughs> spring rolls I wonder why um <laughs> nice. and she, yeah and she was a waitress there and um she met a lot of friends in Chinatown and she told me that she's like, Oh, cause we were talking about taxation being theft. And she's like, Oh wow. That reminds me. One of my friends, she owned a bakery in Chinatown. And one day the police came and they just grabbed her arms and uh, put handcuffs on her behind her back and arrested her. And she was yelling and saying, what? I didn't do anything wrong. I, I paid my rent. I I'm not, cheating anyone i'm just i just have this chinese bakery Mm. and they're like you forgot to you know pay your taxes on this specific regulation Hmm. you know some some Mm. code or Mm -hmm. that she forgot and Mm. overlooked 
just like Jillian. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and my mom was so angry and I'll never forget her saying this, but she goes, she's like, it's so insane. They work so good or we work so goddamn hard and they just come in <laughs> and they take our money. And I'm t- that's just how, you know, her accent is. She has a child. <laughs> Vietnamese accent but um <laughs> no she you know her emotion was very real she felt outraged just yeah. realizing right, that right, right. she just wanted to be free and her friend in that example just having a bakery uh providing a service that of a voluntary service providing goods um not at the barrel of a gun just saying hey i make baked goods you want some or not okay whatever and yeah. you know just yeah. totally voluntary yeah. and they come in and they imprison her throw her in a jail cell and my mom was just so angry and um yeah so <laughs> wow yeah that's but, a great that's a great um that's a great story a great example of uh yeah I of how that. i mean i mean uh that's actually that's a great example of a victimless crime in that most yes. most crimes that people get um imprisoned for are victimless crimes and you know go, going back to the other conversation we had about uh about you know condemning people for acts of of a crime in the future like a true crime let's say where they hurt someone like uh, yeah. I, what comes to mind to me is the seatbelt law and how you don't have your seatbelt on or let's say a broken taillight you know you get a ticket and or you or, or you, if you resist that or if, you, or if you don't pay you you know you go to jail and, or speeding tickets, exactly. Or, or a speeding ticket, and and then and then if, if you try to argue that and like say I didn't hurt anybody, that then they would say like for example the um um the seatbelt, and they say I didn't hurt anybody by not wearing a seatbelt, and they say but in the future, uh, if you got into an accident, your body would have moved, like would have been thrown out, and then you would have hurt someone else. So that's why we're <laughs> it's just so weird, like all this yeah. gym, all this gymnastics that they go through. Oh, and I've even heard too that oh, but if you don't have a seatbelt, you're hurting yourself. <laughs> so it's like you're getting punished for for your in good. the future potentially, yeah, maybe hurting yourself. But it's like you own yourself, so what? I, actually, that reminds <laughs> it's so me. Backwards. That reminds me. It's of like the... we care so much about your well-being, so we're gonna imprison you, <laughs> threaten you with death because we care so much about your well-being. Yeah, <laughs> it's so backwards. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me of the uh, like um, marijuana laws. A drug war, and uh, and and then they say, uh, you know, they they find they say find a guy with a joint or something, and and they're like, all right, all right, hand behind your back, and they're like, what? I didn't hurt anybody. And like, marijuana is gonna ruin your life, so we gotta put you in prison <laughs> and, and ruin like, your life. And, and, and so and so I, I go to prison, and then I, I, I and then I have that on my record, and then I come out, I'm I'm an, I'm an ex convict, and nobody wants to hire me. <laughs> And what was the reason? Oh, and that you not bu- to mention, <laughs> why you know you're in prison with people who are in there for victim crimes, right? Like yeah. rapists, murderers, yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. you know it's not just movies like Shawshank Redemption. It's not a dramatization. There yeah. is violence in prisons. It's right. literally right. a congregation yeah. of some of the most violent people. <laughs> So. Exactly. Exactly. So, well, yeah. wonderful conversation. I don't want to take up any of your time, any more of your time. Um, if uh, if anybody <laughs> wants to follow the philosopher, you can uh, you can go to her website, thephilosopher dot com. Check her out. Um, so, before we go, um, I, as you know, I ask all my guests a uh, uh, your favorite quote of all time. What is your favorite quote of all time? I probably asked you this the first time, but I forgot what you said, <laughs> and I'm sure it's different right now <laughs> since we all change. Value is subjective, right? Every quote, <laughs> maybe you have a different quote every week, right? So, <laughs> exactly. So, what's your quote We're this from week? every minute? I value <laughs> <For> every minute. <laughs> oh man, um, I mean, it's hard to say that I have a favorite. Uh, just like it's hard to say what's my favorite genre of music or favorite color. You no, know, I like I like different colors and bands. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Pick one. But uh, the quote that first came to mind I, I, actually, I, actually reminds me of, of asking somebody What do you want to do Like asking a kid What do you want to be when you go, get older what do you, yeah. want, what do you want to do for the rest of your life You can't do anything different You got to pick one thing you want to do for the rest of your life It's the funniest right. thing Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah before you have your 20 You know 15 to 20 years of world experience right. With other people Yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> That's what looks cool um, Well the first quote that comes to mind and i said this in our first interview together so if anyone's seen that this is just a repeat awesome. but it's mm-hmm. one of my favorite quotes of all time and it is the first step to knowledge is to know yourself or as socrates apparently said 
you know, he just said, know thyself. There's got to be more to it because I know people, you know, quote and paraphrase, but short version is know thyself. And that is the first step to wisdom and knowledge. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's the quote. That's all you're wondering. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And I remember from our first conversation <laughs> that when you said that, I remembered that Socrates was known as the philosopher. He was he was just called the philosopher, and then you and and then I said, so you stole you stole his intellectual property. And oh like, yeah, I remember. You. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> and then I'm just I'm just rehashing our conversation. And then and then I said it's okay because you changed the I to an O, so you changed you actually changed it. So you didn't steal his exactly. intellectual. <laughs> I followed the government standards. I tweaked it just a little bit, so it's not really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you're you're so you're covering your butt. That's excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. We will definitely have you back on because we have much more to talk about. There's just not enough oh. time. In uh, in in the years of our lives to do, to have these wonderful conversations and for people to learn from them, you know, because that's our goal is to teach teach people the beauty of free markets and and what uh, what true capitalism can achieve and 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 volunteerism as well. So, thank you very much, uh, philosopher, for a wonderful conversation. So, hello. no problem. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, this is Peace Anarchism <laughs> on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, and thus he's uh, the solpodcast.org SOL and the Conscious Resistance Network. So wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye, Danelle. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.